Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our online service from ATL. We're so glad that you had take that time out of your schedule to be a part of what's going on here, what God is doing here at ATL. I just want to open this service up with prayer, and let's just pray for those that are still dealing with COVID, uh, in quarantine, uh, maybe trying to get over the virus themselves. And uh, I'm so thankful for what God done for each and every one of you. Uh, just to kind of an update, Brother Sidney McDaniels, of course, Monday, I reached out to several of you, plus I probably reached out to close to, I ended up adding up close to over 200 preachers that I, I reached out to because Brother McDaniel was very serious. Uh, uh, it, it was not good at all. He was turning, uh, the skin was kind of turning blue and purplish and everything and uh, had, had a hard time even standing on his own, even being able to breathe good, different things. Long story short, most of you are aware of this, but in case you are not, uh, Brother McDaniel went to the hospital. We began to pray. We began to seek the face of God. All they could find wrong with him was a little dehydration plus a little potassium. They gave him some fluid, potassium, discharged him from the hospital. And, uh, and then Tuesday morning, he was a whole lot better, feeling a whole lot better when I talked with him. So we want to give God praise and honor and glory for I believe he done a miracle. And uh, I tell you what, if he done it for Brother McDaniels, God can do it for you too. So let's just open up with prayer right now. God, we thank you for what you've been doing. We thank you for what you're doing. And we thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for touching Brother McDaniel's body, God. We thank you for touching each and every individual, God, that we have been praying and seeking your face for. I pray that you continue to let virtue flow through each and every individual, God. I pray, Lord, that you would move in this service tonight, God. Have your perfect will and your way in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. If you're standing in your home, you can be seated. Hallelujah. Uh, we, we're doing a forego. Uh, any kind of singing or music tonight, I apologize for that. But uh, just about almost every one of our musicians, except for uh, maybe Brother Jordan playing the drums, every one of them are in quarantine. And so it's, it's pretty much, uh, you wouldn't want me uh, doing the singing and playing tonight. But we're going to get right into the word of the Lord, and some of them will be back with us this Sunday. I want to pick back up, uh, it seems like it's been a long time since we've been talking about the believer's warfare, but I believe it's important that we finish out this series, and I, I do feel led to do it tonight. And I, I want to talk to us on, on lesson number seven, and uh, we're going to start off with our key scriptures. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 10 through 18, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 16th verse says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The 18th verse says, Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. Hallelujah. So tonight in lesson 7, our final lesson, we're going to be talking about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Just to kind of a little bit of a final inspection here, this is again the concluded study of the Acts 
show physical weapons of the soldier. Before progress into a discussion of the sword of the spirit, one final look at the soldier and his characteristics would be very beneficial for each and every one of us. Understand that every soldier is to fight with all of his heart. He is to struggle against the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, never allowing a moment of spiritual ease. You see, the soldier will either be in warfare or preparation for the warfare. For the soldier to wait for the attack of the enemy to come is a foolish strategy. There are times that the saint of God must be on the offensive and pray without ceasing. Often the soldier uh, does not invest uh, his greatest effort until he is in the midst of the valley. However, if one could ever grasp the concept that the will cannot wait to be attacked in, uh, then his warfare will be much more successful. The soldier, I want you to understand something, cannot afford to wait for the days of turbulence to prove that he or she can master the storm. He has to go on the offensive. And before the attack ever comes, while all is still peaceful in the soul, when the tempter is not in sight, while all is calm, the soldier must exercise himself to discipline by self-denial. The way to resist indulgence uh, in the unlawful things of the flesh uh, is to appropriate the powers uh, and the faculties uh, to obedience uh, in giving up things uh, that are lawful. Paul illustrates this very well, that there are some limitations of liberty. Let's look at the following scriptures here. 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. The Bible tells us that all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 10 and 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things uh, edify not. Uh, so just because I'm, it's okay, or uh, just because it's not against the law in the natural does not mean I should do it. Okay? I mean, it, it's, it's not against the law. I'm 21 years old, plus a few years, <laughs> and I'm you know, it's not against the law for me to um, drink alcohol. In certain states, it's not against the law for me to have recreational marijuana. But just because it's lawful to me does not mean it would edify me. Just because it's, it's okay in this world sense does not mean it's going to be something that is going to be for my benefit. Let me put it into a nutshell for you. Just because it's not sin does not mean it cannot become a weight to you. The Bible said to lay aside every sin and weight that so easily besets you. So it's not just sin. It's weight that we have to worry about. Because there are certain restraints that are necessary. The soldier must be trained spiritually to work towards overcoming the enemy. There are certain demands that every successful soldier will have in his life. He must have the willingness for self-sacrifice. He must be an encourager, not only of himself, but also of others. I was thinking, with was on my mind yesterday and today, and in fact, I asked, I believe it might have been Sunday. I cannot remember what day it was or Monday that I asked you to, uh, you know, in, in this week, take a, take a different day throughout and, and find somebody who's being affected by COVID, with, especially that is 
part of ATF and reach out and encourage them. Don't always be the one that everybody's encouraging you. I want you to understand that. Sometimes we can be so selfish. I'm talking to ATF right now. And we don't even realize it. We, it's always about us. And we never think about anybody else. Now I want you to understand something. The Bible begins to describe mercy. And it talks about the amount of mercy that is going to be given to you. It's going to be determined by the amount of mercy that you give to others. Okay? So let me change that around a little bit. Sometimes we want somebody to encourage us. And we feel like no one ever encourages us. Well, when is the last time you encouraged somebody? When is the last time that you sent a text to somebody? When is the last time you picked up the phone and called or texted somebody and said, you know what? I'm there for you. I'm there to be an encourager. I'm there to be a help because there's going to come a time. You may feel good today. You may have everything with no ripples on the water. But friend, there's going to come a time you're going to need an encourager. And it's important that we don't just be an encourager of ourselves, but we be an encourager of others. I don't know why it's been on my mind. It has burdened me so strong the last two or three days. When you receive that encouragement from others, be grateful for it. You said, Brother Bill, if I am grateful, then let individuals know that you're grateful. See, see, see it, it, it goes a long ways. You say, well, I shouldn't have to let people know that I'm grateful that they... That, that they encourage me, that they help me, that they shouldn't be doing it for that reason. That's not the point. You don't buy your kids gifts so that they, you do it for the reason for them to tell you how grateful they are. But it goes a long ways when you do buy them things and they say, I'm appreciative. I'm thankful for what you're doing. It's important as we work together as a family. I, this is nowhere in my notes. And, and if you request these notes, uh, you're not going to find this anywhere in the notes. I'm just obeying what I felt in prayer this week. It's, in, it's important, church, that we learn to show gratitude one towards another. If you want God to show gratitude with you, then friend, it's just like in the Bible where it talks about how can we expect God to forgive us if we cannot forgive one another? Well, it's the same way works. How can we expect God to show gratitude to us if we are not showing gratitude back for what He is doing and then showing gratitude one towards another? Hallelujah, I want to move on. So a soldier must have a willingness for self-sacrifice. He must be an encourager, not only of himself, but of others. He must have the traits of endurance. He must submit himself to both discipline of the flesh and of the spirit. He must be vigilant. He must have a sense of obedience and loyalty to the chief commander. He must be in ready cooperation with the movements of the church. He must be filled with enthusiasm in his associations with other soldiers. He will benefit from being in unity with those that are around him. He must have a sense of earnestness in his pursuit of God. So let's move forward and talk about the soldier's response to the fight. When the soldier to the fight, he cannot afford to follow the leading of Joash. You say, what do you mean? Fight not as Joash did in the Bible, who smote the ground with the arrows only three times. It was half-hearted effort involved. By stopping after only the three blows, he denied the kingdom the full victory. You know what I feel? I feel like that he only done it because he was asked to do it. What would have happened if he would have put his heart into it? If he would have put his energy into it? If he would have put his desire into it? Don't be guilty 
of just doing it because the man of God asked you to do it. Just, or because the brother or sister asked you to pray. Do it with all of your heart. Fight the good fight of faith. Uh, then it's not, I, it's not an obligation of me be having to, I don't have to serve God. I get to serve God. The soldier cannot fight as Israel did in their conquest of Canaan. That they, they became suspended in their conquest and did not totally exterminate the enemy. By allowing the ancient inhabitants to remain, they did not receive the full benefit of the rest that they could have had with that land flowing with milk and honey. How many individuals in their walk with God never reached their potential because they never totally yield to what God wants to do in their life. They're willing to go so far, and that's as far as they're willing to go. God is as far as I'll let you take me. I'm only going to go so far in prayer. I'm only going to go so far in fasting. I'm only going to go so far in commitment. I'm only going to go so far in the things of God. But if you gave it your all, you might receive total victory within your home and within your family. When one looks, for example, at how to fight the enemy, he can look at the lives of other great soldiers within the book, within the Bible. Fight as Joseph fought, who said, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? <clears throat> fight as Paul did, who brought forth the great spiritual truth of bringing the body under subjection. Fight as Jesus Christ did as he told the disciples to fight. Mm -hmm. If the eye is the offended member, he said, rid oneself of it. Or if the hand is the offended member, then remove it. Fight as Jesus fought when he was faced with the temptations of his arch enemy, the devil. He defeated the thoughts of discontent, of ambition, of the debasing servitude that Satan desired. It was done so in this matter by using the word of God. Get thee hit, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy serve. The sword of the Spirit proves that the word is always effective to us. Who are to us who are attempting to overcome the difficulties of the flesh and the spirit. Let's talk about the characteristics of a good soldier. You see, a good soldier of Jesus Christ must first kind of wish I had Brother Donnie here tonight and I could have him dressed up like a soldier and um, maybe you could get a better picture of this. But uh, the very first thing that that soldier must do when he decides to become a soldier, is he's got to enlist. He's got to become enlisted. Before man can ever fully rid himself of the failures of the flesh, he must obey this salvation message that was outlined in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, which was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the way to salvation is only by Acts 2 and 38, uh, which involves repentance, Water baptism in Jesus' name and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. Once this is accomplished, a man has been enlisted into the spiritual struggle. To be enlisted, you've got to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. But after a soldier is enlisted, it don't just stop there. You just don't sign up to be a soldier and then you go home and you sit on the bench. You got to be drilled. A great soldier is not made in a day. When the fire of the furnace and the difficulties of the trial sets in on the soldier, he should not lose heart. These fires have the, the capacity to burn away the unwanted things and to bring forth the pure gold in his life. This is the drilling process. When that soldier goes to uh, 
to boot camp, and he kept that drill sergeant. There's a reason they call him a drill sergeant. So we're drilling some things, <coughs> excuse me, in them, and they're drilling some things out of them. See, they're just trying to keep them, teach them how to be submitted. That they, they don't need a soldier that's going to argue with them. They don't need a soldier that's going to question everything that the commander is telling them to do. Because when they get out there and the bullets are flying, and they said, get the dirt, they don't need a soldier to sort of question the motives of the commander, but they need to hit the dirt. They may not understand why they're hitting the dirt. They may not understand why they're having to do what they're having to do, but the commander is doing it for their own good. Great pains are taken to train the soldier. And he must endure hardness as a good soldier. Not only do you just go through boot camp and, and, and be drilled, but you got to be a fighter. Serving God is not for sissies, not for wills. you got to be a fighter. The soldier who is willing to be involved in the battle will also experience certain wounds at times. However, this is part of the spiritual battle. And God has what we need to treat the wounds of the battle. There's individuals that say, I don't want to live for God. I get hurt living for God. People hurt me. Fred, you signed up. You didn't sign up for a country club membership. You signed up for war. It's a battle in living for God. Sometimes there's friendly fire, unfortunately, in living for God. But the truth, the truth of it all is, I came to fight, but I also came to win. The flesh, the world, and the devil have to be fought against. If the soldier has no fight in him, he will never be successful enough to gain the reward. But not only does he have to be a fighter, he's got to be obedient. The soldier must be obedient to the God-given authorities in his life. The foremost factor of an obedience is to be obedient to his word. For the people, I have no problem being submitted to God's word or to the man of God in my life. Well, it's not submission if you want to do it anyway. Real submission is doing it when you don't, your flesh does not want to do it. That's submission. I'm just telling you, my flesh don't always want to do right. My flesh don't always want to obey what that word said. But that's where real submission comes in when I bring my flesh under subjection. So the foremost factor of obedience is to be obedient to God and to his word. The second role is that of obedience to the leader of the church. Do pastors make mistakes? Absolutely. Just as saints make mistakes. However, there is a difference in my role and your role. <clears throat> there's individuals that hopefully there's not an ATL, but think I don't have to have a, a you know, I'm, I'm happy having a preacher, but I don't have to have a pastor. I, I can, you know, I, I can make it without that. But let me explain to you the difference of why you have to have a pastor. Why you can't just stay at home and be saved? Let me explain to you. Bob said you can't hear without a preacher, number one. <clears throat> but let me explain something else to you. The Bible calls your pastor a watchman that's on the wall. Those that are not pastors are not watchmen. They're standing down at the base of the wall. Don't mean that the pastor is better than the other individual, but it does mean he's got a different responsibility. Because if you are standing on this side of the wall or this side of the wall, you cannot see what's on the other side of the wall. The pastor being the watchman is, if he does his job right, is on the wall. He's standing on the wall and he can see both that way and he can see that way. You can only see on the side of the wall that you're on. That's why sometimes when a pastor preaches, things that cut to the flesh, and things that your flesh does not agree with, it's not because he wants to do it, but he realizes that there are things further down the road that you cannot see. He is seeing it because he's the watchman on the wall. And later on, you'll recognize because when you move 
move to the other side of the wall, you'll realize that's what that man of God was talking about. I'm glad I listened. Hopefully you can say that instead of I wish I would listen. Hallelujah. The role of the watchman on the wall in Ezekiel is effective for us to remember the position of the ministry. The ministry has not been given to be a lord over God's heritage, but rather as a watchman who is concerned about the status of the soul of every member of the church. It don't matter if they pay the most tithes and offers or they don't pay any at all. My, my, my prayers are just the same for every individual. My desires to see you saved is just the same. Why? That's what a real watchman to do. He's, he's praying. He's walking under a burden. He's filling the load. He wants to see you saved. So a good soldier must be obedient. Also a good soldier, there must be unity. <clears throat> there has never been a successful battle fought with one soldier. The army is involved. The infantry depends upon the, the pilots to assault enemy positions by air and weaken the strongholds. The Navy is responsible for transporting the soldiers to the land for the attack. There is not a single soldier who can win a battle alone. He, he's always going to have to work with others. God don't have no long rangers in his kingdom. It's going to take us working together. You go, oh, brother, I don't need anybody's help. And I, don't, I don't have to help anybody. I'm, I'm going to do this by myself. Friend, you will never make it. The book is against you in that, that you cannot survive. The book of Acts gives us numbers of examples about how the church is to work with a sense of unity. Without unity, the soldier will not be successful in his or her spiritual struggle. So now let's move forward and talk about the sword of the spirit. The Bible says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is the most powerful book that has ever been written. A lifetime of study will not even tap the surface of the rich veins of truth that is found in that book. The Bible is more, I want you to understand, church, it's whether you're a minister or you're not, I want you to understand it. It's more than just a place for a minister to get sermons from. It, it's a source of comfort during times of duress. It's a storehouse of promises during the times of spiritual famine. It is a source of doctrine. It gives the doctrine of salvation, of sin, of heaven and hell, of, of, of the church, and many more elements that God chose to provide for man. You know, how often do you read your word? How often do you teach your children to read the word? It's important. Let's talk about the sword of the word. The Old Testament has a great deal to say about the sword of the word. Often it is described as a sword. And a number of different verbs are attached to describe both its effect and its use. The following text, uh, I know we're going to talk about it real quick, gives reference to the fact that the sword is sent out against the enemies and it is wetted and drunk with blood. This is profound victory that is demonstrated against the enemies of God and of his people. Amos 9 and 4, the Bible tells us, and though they go into captivity before their enemies, this will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. Isaiah 31 and 8 tells us, Then shall the Assyrians fall with the sword, not of a mighty man, and the sword, not of a mean man, shall devour him, but he shall flee from the sword, and his young man shall be discomfited. 
Isaiah 34 and 5 through 6 says, For by the sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Adelium and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness. And with the blood of lambs and goats. With the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozra. And a great slaughter in the land of Adelium. <coughs> Jeremiah 25 and 29. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city. Which is called by my name. And should be utterly unpunished. Ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword. Upon all the inhabitants of the earth. Saith the Lord of mm -hmm. hosts. And then Jeremiah 47 and 6. O thou sword of the Lord. How long will it be ere thou be quiet. Put up thyself in thy scabbard. Rest and be still. One notes. In the conquest of the Midianites. That. Gideon proclaimed with a battle cry, the sword of the Lord in Gideon. When you note that, it would give meaning that God's sword was equated with that of Gideon's. There were a number of, it, of the enemies of God, some examples, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, who, who made reference to the sword of their gods also. However, there is a vast difference and the distinctions given. For example, the Assyrians referred to their own armies as the iron sword of the god Asher, and in the same breath as the army of the king of the gods. Yet when looking at these terms, one must understand that if the earthly king was involved, then there was no need for Asher to be involved in the battle. Such is the mode of humanistic thinking that a man's security rests either with himself or with the resources that he has stockpiled and helped him. <coughs> the living God is a up close and a personal God. Excuse all the coughing. It ain't even COVID related. Hallelujah. I ain't coughed a bit so right when I got ready to feel like it's sinus and allergy. <clears throat> the living God <clears throat> is a up close and a personal God. He is at the receiving end of every prayer that one prays. And looking at the Old Testament references, it was God who often participated in the battles of Israel using his own arms. If the Lord of hosts chooses to fight the battle with a troop of soldiers who are carrying swords, bows, and shields, God is not dependent on their resources to win the battle for him. He can win the victory with his holy angels. When we look into Joshua 5 and 13, we find such references that document such the Bible says that it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and he said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captains of the host and as of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he did worship. And he said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servants? And the captain of the Lord hopes, said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. 2 Samuel 5 and 24 says, And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going to the tops of the mulberry tree, and then thou shalt be scared thyself, but then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. 
Deuteronomy 9 and 3. Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord hath said unto thee. Not only does God have the command of holy angels, at his hand. He also has the capacity to win with a ridiculously small number of men like he did with Gideon. Or he may take a stone tossed from a slain like David and win the battle. In reference to Ephesians 6 and 17, one must understand that words and sounds can play a decisive role in the battle. This holds true not only in the Old Testament, but also in ancient world histories. Oracles are read to encourage the soldiers in their struggles. Curses were pronounced upon enemies. Uh, orators would be hired to encourage the troops to do great heroic service. Uh, last minute prayers were prayed immediately before entering into the battle. Uh, uh, Commands were shouted and acknowledged, and there were yells uh, that were accompanying the charge. All of these actions were accomplished by the use of words. When one looks to uncover the spiritual truth in Ephesians 6 and 17, one finds that the word used in the uh, confrontation of the saints is the gospel of peace which was first proclaimed by the Messiah. According to Ephesians 6 and 18 through 20, the mode of, of, uh, of yielding and, and using the particular word is by fervent prayer. Uh, the prayer of the saints of God is of great importance. Uh, the gospel of peace, uh, let me tell you, it goes through prison walls, uh, it goes before courts, uh, it goes to Rome, uh, thus it will go to all of the world as we find in Acts 28 30-31. Uh, it should become clear that the mere ability uh, to quote the word of God does not exhaust the use uh, of the word of God, uh, which the saints uh, are to make. There are new prayers to be prayed. There are new meditations to discover of the word of the Lord. There are a multitude of forms of proclamations that are at our fingers for evangelism. You will never fully learn this word. It is you have to continually. You can come back to it over and over again. And God will continue to reveal the truth. And God will continue to reveal things of his word. Let me rephrase that. It's, it's not new truth as if there, there's a new revelation that no one knows about. No, 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 no. I'm talking about God will begin to reveal things to you that you've never seen before, but it's been there all the time. There must be a great love for the scriptures that God has so carefully placed in our hands. A brief detail here. From what we're teaching, Hebrews 4 and 12, the Bible tells us, for the word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joys and moral, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This is an off quoted verse in reference to the power that lies within the word of God. The word quick here is an old English word that carries the same meaning as alive or living. The word of God is alive. It has the ability to illuminate the hearts and the motives of man. There is not one single behavior that has been left out of the word of God, either mentioned or given as an example. All of the unruly spirits that attempt to rumble within the flesh are addressed within the word of God. By looking at this particular portion of text here in Hebrews, one understands that the word of God not only has the ability to inspire faith uh, and to bring encouragement, but it also can be the voice of judgment that God supplies. 
Sharper than a two-edged sword. Means that it is literally a two-mouth sword. A two-mouth sword. The word mouth was given to the sword because it seems to devour all that lays before it. It has the capacity to not only destroy sin, but it also has the capacity to give instruction that allows one to destroy the wild beasts within the lives of men. Let's talk about the river of God. When one looks at the Greek New Testament, more, uh, more directly to Ephesians 6 and 17, one notes that Paul used the word rima for the word. The word rima was not used by Paul uh, often in his epistles. In fact, there is very limited use of the word uh, rima in the uh, Pauline epistles. Paul would primarily, when he would say, to talk about the word, he would be talking about the word logos, L-O-G-O-S, when pinning the epistles. But it is thus understood to be a very weighty, revelatory, uh, prophetic, or binding pronouncement of judgment when it is used like it's used here. Paul gave the sword the highest level of interpretation available to him because of the power that existed within the spiritual sword. The sword that Paul was alluded to in this particular verse was, and we'll spell it for you, in the Greek it's M-A-C-H-A-I-R-A. And what it is, it means is a small dagger. It, you know, a small dagger, it was more handier and, and easier to use, and, but it also required more skill in its handling than the large broadsword that we would think about when we think about a sword. The large broadsword required very little skill and generally relied on the soldier's ability to put great weight and force behind the swing. However, the small dagger that Paul is having reference to here required a great deal of skill in learning how to use it. It was a weapon that was most effective in up close fighting. When Jesus faced Satan in the wilderness, he carefully pointed him towards the boundaries that are established by the Word of God. Some of the, here are some of the following reasons that are given as why one must study the Word of God. We should study the Word of God, church, number one, to know what the truth is. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so, I, as the Word of God relates to us, you should follow me, your pastor, as I follow Christ. But how are you going to know if I'm following Christ if you don't know what this book is saying? We should have text of scripture at command. As the Savior did. To meet the various forms of temptation. When Satan came and he tempted him. Jesus every time used the word of God. We should be able to quote scriptures. David said I'm going to hide this word in my heart. That I might not sin against thee. We, we should not depend upon our own reason. Our wisdom to overcome the tempter, but use the word of God. We should see the importance of training up our children in the accurate study of the word of God. I remember, I was thinking of this uh, on Tuesday. Now I remember as a kid, now many of you heard me talk sometimes about the Sunday school teacher that I have, Brother Danny Edge, and uh, He's dead and gone on to meet his reward. But Brother Edgem was my favorite Sunday school teacher probably of all time. And I remember an old Indian guy come in there and, and uh, Sister Stapley, you like this. He, it wasn't a diet Pepsi, but he set a Pepsi on that, that classroom desk every time he got ready to teach. And uh, but he would begin to break up with the word of the Lord. And I remember something that he said. He said, no, take care of your Bible. Don't just throw your Bible around. That's, that's the holy word of God. 
Don't, don't, don't set things on top of your Bible. Don't, don't, you know, the Bible is not another magazine. It's not another book. So we're not just going to pile things on top of it. We're not going to allow dust to get up on it. Parents, hopefully this is children that are doing this, but I hope that we're not doing this either. But you ought to take a look at the, around your seats where you sit sometimes. Sometimes I find Bibles that are laying on the floor. Maybe they're just pages are torn out of them. They've been colored in. I, uh, I, I picked up a Bible the other day. It bothered me to do this. I'm going to be very honest. I have a hard time throwing away a Bible. I just, it's just fun. But this Bible had been in this church for several, several months. <laughs> And it had just been tossed from one seat to the next, and the cover had been torn off, and the and the pages of it, and people just moved it from one place to. I mean, they had to move it because it just didn't fly from from one side of the church to the other, from the front to the back. And finally, I had disposed of it properly. You know, we, we wouldn't we wouldn't dare treat a flag the wrong way. We wouldn't burn it. Hopefully not. We wouldn't allow it to touch the ground. We would, as much as I love that flag, this word of God is a million times more important. Teach your children the importance of the word of God. Teach your children how important it is. In fact, uh, it's okay to leave a Bible here, but not if you ain't got a Bible at home. See, I, I, I use a lot of different Bible resources. I, I've, got, I've got a computer program that costs Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. I ended up one time for the time that I, but way before I started evangelizing, I have spent close between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars on a Bible program. I didn't do it over over. I didn't do it overnight. I did this over a decade of time uh, that I did this, and, uh, and so that computer program means a lot to me. Hundreds of commentaries, hundreds of that, but there's something about it. You, you see this iPad right here. Uh, I can read my Bible on it. Uh, my phone right here. Uh, I can read my I can read my Bible uh, on it. Uh, I can do uh, the uh, but I can also look at the weather on it. I, I can look at the news on it. I can look at Facebook. I can do a lot of things. That old holy book, that old Bible, uh, friend, it's not that. It, it, it's 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 the mind of God. It's the heartbeat of God, and nothing will ever replace that word. Hide it in your heart. The Word of God reaches the heart, which is the very center of action. If there are scripture, scripture principles guiding our walk in life, then we are more successful in our striving for the mastery. The sinner dies, which allows him to become dead to his former desires and deeds. According to Romans 7 and 9, the sinner is slain by the law. This is done by the conviction of the Word of God. The word of God works not to worsen the condition of man, but it awakens, it convicts, it converts, and it sanctifies the soul. There should be discipline in every Christian to attempt to handle the word of God with skill and precision. It's a two-edged sword. So what does that mean? You can take this word right here. And you can, see, you can take a hammer and you can build a house with a hammer or you can tear a house down. You can take this word and build somebody up or you can tear them down. Peter poured out his sword in the natural, cut a man's ear off, and the Lord had to set his last miracle was to undo Peter's mistake. Because Peter used his sword the wrong way. Don't use this sword the wrong way as a vendetta against people. Hallelujah. This should be done by the convicting of the word of the Lord. That sinner should be slain. The word of God works again in our life. There should be discipline again to handle it by skill and precision. And for the ministry, I know it is my, it is my desire, probably would never be able to do it, but it's, it's probably my desire to preach this word, this book entirely before they lay me at my death. Uh, every year, I just, I've got one that'll be in, I think, this Friday, I believe it is. Uh, I, I get a new Bible. And the reason I get that new Bible is I highlight. At the beginning of that year, I highlight 
if, if it's in purple, it, it's preaching. If it's in yellow, it, it's teaching. And I will highlight every scripture that I use within that year. Because I like to go back and reflect and say, how long has it been since I used this scripture? How long has it been since I read and I studied this scripture out? The motivating call to every minister is a simple command to preach. That word is my ultimate call. I know I do a lot of things. I help a lot of people in different areas. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. I don't claim to know a lot. But I'm thankful God has given me some wisdom and uh, some education in some of these areas. But I, I want you to understand something. God, I'm not complaining. I, 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 I'm not telling you not to be saved. But God never called me to be an administrator. He didn't call me to be an accountant. He didn't call me to be an investment advisor. He didn't call me to be a career counselor, etc. on and on. But rather, he called me to preach and to teach the counsel of God. Let's talk about in closing here the soldier's proper response of cultivating a teachable heart. The kingdom parables in Matthew chapter 13, it begins with the sower. And the different types of grounds. Understand that when you talk about the different types of ground, it is referring to the heart. The heart of a true soldier must be visited by a number of things that God can use to create some missingness on our part to become the soldier that God wants us to be. There are often tears of sorrow and, and disappointment that comes to our lives. But the tears will always moisten the soil so that the farmer can come along and remove the roots of bitterness more easily. The heart of a true soldier is like the field of rich soil that is well tended by the farmer. Not everything can grow there. Weeds, crowd grass, uh, chunks of grass, etc. can stifle the abundant fruit that the Lord works to grow. Numerous times we are prone to react to the teaching of Scripture with a defensive and a stubborn attitude. We, we become stiff-necked, as the Bible talks about, and the Spirit has no ability to guide our lives. According to Proverbs 12 and 15, fools always think that their way is the only way, and they think it is the right way. As a pastor, I can expose you to the truth. Understand something. But I cannot make you incorporate and appropriate it into your daily life. I encourage you to develop your own plan to open up this book, this treasure chest. Personal Bible study can begin today. Not only can one read the Bible, but read books that are Christian themes. Guess what? During a person in our church that shouldn't be able to teach a Bible study if you've been in church for any time at all. The most effective way to continue personal Bible study is to stay out of ruts. Season your study with periods of prayer and at times mix in some fasting. And you will be amazed at how God can direct soldiers who have a teachable heart. Thank you again. I hope you've learned something from these series. Uh, if, if you desire uh, these notes from this, uh, this lesson or any other lesson, please let me know. I'll, I'll email them to you if you're a member of our church. And also, uh, if you missed any lessons in the previous, they're all up linked out there on SoundCloud, and you can find all the previous six lessons there. Uh, just a few announcements in closing. If, if uh, I, I want to thank those that have been faithfully be given. Uh, faith, you, and, uh, you know if I'm talking to you or not. And, you, and, you, and so you know if I'm not talking to you or not. But whether you have dropped your tithing off here at the church, uh, your offerings off here at the church, uh, whether you uh, have been given online, many have done that, or, or whatever. I want you to know about from the bottom of my heart the church, we appreciate that. There's a lot of churches across this country that had suffered when we had to go to online type services only. But uh, church, you have been faithful, and I want you to know that I appreciate that. So if you want to give it by the time layout, you can. If you want to give it and whatever works.
works best for you. Uh, again, we will be start returning back to church, Lord willing, this Sunday, uh, December the 6th. There will be no Sunday school classes this Sunday due to so many teachers and kids still being out in quarantine. And uh, this will only be one service this Sunday. Uh, 1.30 p.m., pre-service prayer at 1 o'clock. Our building has been thoroughly sanitized, and we appreciate uh, Sister Crystal for doing that. We will resume uh, Sunday school classes on Sunday, December the 13th, where we will go back to having both services, 1.30 and 3 o'clock. And uh, we'll wait to the end to have our new discipleship class and be kicking off on 12-13. Currently, the plan is, again, to still have our Christmas program. I'll be talking more about that this weekend, the calls, uh, all of that. I've got to confirm everything with mine, but it's, it's, it's scheduled for 12-20. We'll have our program at 1-30 here at the church. Our banquet is scheduled for 5 o'clock. Also, once you are out of quarantine, feel free to use the building to come and pray. Uh, right now, there's only about three or four people signing that prayer law. I know we've got about uh, quite a few that are in quarantine. We ain't got that many. So uh, why don't you come by the house of God and, and make, if you're able to begin to pray in the time of that prayer law. And remember to sign the prayer law. And if you need the social distance when you come in, it should, should, should be no problem. Uh, please do that. No prayer meetings again during the month of December as far as our uh, Monday night prayer meetings, whether it be men and women or corporate, uh, or our midnight prayer, we're, we're, uh, we're going to uh, not have that due to the fact of uh, just trying to get through the month of December, start 2021 with a, a healthy with spirit and continue a spirit of revival. Uh, Thank Sister Ashley for coordinating a, uh, the sign up and everything We're, uh, for this the, the great 24-hour uh, prayer chain that started at I believe it was six o'clock yesterday and went to six o'clock to today. And so thank you, Sister Ashley, for coordinating that as we were praying uh, for those that are affected within our church and outside of our church by the coronavirus. If you need us. Please reach out and let me know. Uh, I'll be glad. I'm not a quarantine. Uh, you know, everybody, I'm healthy. So, so please reach out, and, and, and uh, I'll be there to help you in any way that I can. We love you. We appreciate you. May God bless you, and hopefully we will see you this Sunday, if not, as soon as you are able to come. May God bless you in Jesus' name.